Hey, I'm Kale, and that's Michael Jordan. And today I'm looking at Beatles for Sale. Beatles for Sale is the Beatles' fourth studio album, released December of 1964. It was released during the height of Beatlemania when they were touring like crazy, so it was and it was recorded in like one brief pause of touring from August to October of 1964. So they were really just rushing to like get it done and get an album out so they could go back to touring which made the album sound a little bit hectic. It's, to me, I consider the first experimental Beatles album, sort of. It's um, more folky, and it kind of introduces jangle pop a little bit, like right before the birds did. The whole album, too, is basically just like American country music. They had been like touring the southern United States, and they had been getting more into like Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash and stuff like that, so like, there's two Carl Perkins covers on this album, and then like three country songs that could easily just pass as a Carl Perkins cover. But yeah, let's get into the recording, shall we, Michael? Recording sessions for the album started um, on August 11th of 1964 and ended in late October. 1964. Yeah, like I said earlier, the recording sessions were very hectic because they had just gotten off a tour and they had another tour slated for late 1964, early 1965, so they really just had to like hammer it out. Which is why a good amount of the songs on the album are covers. The Beatles had had covers on every album except Hard Day's Night up until th this time, but this is like not majority covers, but there's more covers than there have been on any album previous. And it's kind of the last album where they had like a bunch of covers. Help had one cover and then they didn't have any. I don't, I'm pretty sure they did not have a single cover and, and then until they did Maggie Mae, which was just a folk song. So technically not even a cover of anything specifically. Yeah, that's kind of all I have about recording. It was just hectic and quick. Um, but yeah, let's go to the Drag by Drag Braids album. song is No Reply. No Reply is like a folky acoustic sort of thing. John Lennon initially wrote the song for an artist called, uh, named Tommy Quickly, who is uh, also managed by Brian Epstein. With the first reoccurring theme of the episode, the song was cited by David Crosby as sort of like really inspiring the birds to start recording music, as did kind of this whole album, which I'm obviously going to get into as the album pans out. Because the album sort of sent jangle pop and folk pop into the mainstream where it would be acted upon for like two or three years, most notably by the Birds and David Crosby. Yeah, the song is basically acoustic folk, but the um, guitar, the acoustic guitar riff and the beat that plays over each verse is sort of like bossa nova-y, which was a genre that was very popular specifically in like 1964. Next song is I'm a Loser. I'm a Loser is another one of John Lennon's self-deprecation songs, a lot like Nowhere Man and Your Blues. He wrote a lot of these throughout 1964 and 1965 because he always had this manic depression while going on tour. And this one is straight up a country song. This is just like, this could pass as like a Johnny Cash or Carl Perkins cover. This is just literally a country song. Another thing, John Lennon sings his lowest register of any Beatles song in this. So that's something. Next up is Babies in Black, which is another just straight up country song. It's also the most like Lennon McCartney song that like you could think of. It's like written completely 50-50 between the two. Another thing about the song is that it was a, uh, initially John Lennon was supposed to do the high harmonies, but his voice was literally just so destroyed from like years previous. And this is when he found out that he could not do high harmonies anymore, that he wanted to, for like, majority of the songs from the rest of the Beatles discography, he was supposed to be doing high harmonies, but his voice was literally too destroyed from just touring for the past four years that he just couldn't do it. It was also the first album, mm, first song recorded for the album, uh, recorded entirely on the first day on August 11th. Next up is Rock and Roll Music. Rock and Roll Music is a Chuck Berry song from 1957. Um, George Martin 
plays uh, piano on the song, so that's cool. It was recorded sort of just like like uh, how they recorded Please Please Me as an album, just like literally just playing the song with the instruments while singing, just all is all all is one. Watch that clip back. That sounded like I was having a stroke. It was also released as a single uh, for the album like a week after the album was released. And next up is I'll Follow the Sun. I'll Follow the Sun is like one of the oldest Beatles songs. It was written in like 1956, 1957 by Paul McCartney. And it's suspected that the song was played while John Lennon and Paul McCartney were in the Quarrymen in the late 50s. It was also played uh, by them uh, at the Star Club in Hamburg. It's also only a minute 49, the shortest song on this album, and I'm pretty sure the shortest Beatles song? I can't think of any shorter right now, but I'm pretty sure it's the shortest one. All right, next up is Mr. Moonlight. Mr. Moonlight is a cover of a previously somewhat obscure single by uh, Dr. Feelgood and the Interns. I'd say obscure, it wasn't really obscure, it was more just low charting. Like it made it into the top like 200, but it was at like 160. The Beatles cover is fairly different from the original, I would say. The Beatles cover is more monotone and like creepy and eerie and mysterious. While the original is more like soul. And um, I would say, I've actually thought this for a long time that Mr. Moonlight is like creepier than Revolution 9 is specifically the weird monotone organ solo that's played by George Martin in the middle that sound it like is just like freaks me out for some reason I don't know why but yeah there's a less creepy version of it also from 1964 by the Hollies with uh, a very very tiny Graham Nash on vocals. It's it's never it's never a Beatles episode if I don't randomly mention two or more of the members of Crosby Stills and Nash at one point. But another cool thing about it is that uh, Ringo Starr plays an African djembe um on it, so that's cool. Beatles version is also a bit like calypso sounding, which if you didn't know calypso was a is a music genre very popular in the late fifties and early sixties that originated from Trinidad and Tobago. Which is more subtle hinting on this album of the Beatles future genre verse. Next up is Kansas City slash Hey, 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 Hey. This is a uh, cover of a medley by Stanley Lieber and Mike Stoller, who if you didn't know were one of the big three writing duos from the late 50s, early 60s, along with Carol King and Jerry Goffin and Lennon and McCartney. But yeah, to be completely honest with you, it's probably my least favorite on the album and I'm just not really a fan. Now opening up side two, is eight days a week this was the lead single off of the album released also like a week after but it was like way more successful it peaked at number one despite the fact that it was the last song recorded for the album yeah it's it's pretty good it's like you know a beatles classic Look how freaking fat this cat is oh. next up is words of love words of love is a cover um of a buddy holly song from 1957 i don't really have that much to speak on it about that made no sense i don't really have that much to say about it but it is one of my favorites on the album weirdly enough despite the fact that i have like not much commentary yeah, next up is honey don't uh, first carl perkins cover on this album Honey don't was performed by the beatles for years in the past and it was usually sung with lennon on main vocals but they needed to reach their quota for ringo having at least one song on each album so they just gave it to him it's really messy and like not that good, but it it's charming. And it was like Ringo's favorite song, so you know that's another reason why they gave it to him, I guess. Next up is Every Little Thing. Every Little Thing is a very rare occurrence in the Beatles discography in which it was written mainly by Paul McCartney, but it was sung by John Lennon. At the current moment, I can't really think of any other Beatles songs in which one of them was the main writer but then the other one sung it, so yeah. It is also one of the first songs in the discography that kind of feature like, diff like different instrumentation. That sounded weird, but like instrumentation that they didn't usually use. Like, p like a piano to keep the time or like 
like that you have a timpani over the chorus. Next up is I Don't Want to Spoil the Party. It's another Rockabilly Carl Perkins style, style song that is a John Lennon self-deprecation song. And I do like it. Uh, for a little bit, it was like my favorite on the album, but it has since shifted. Next up is What You're Doing. What You're Doing sounds more instrumentation wise like a bird song than any of the bird song sounds like a bird song straight up jangle pop like this song could be given to 1965 roger mcguinn and david crosby and it would pass so well as a bird song and it currently is actually my favorite on the album it starts with this really cool like four bar drum intro from ringo and then it's before every um, every verse it does it again which i like it's george martin also plays piano on it and the final track on the album is everybody's trying to be my baby which is the second carl perkins cover on the album it's sung by george so he gets a song on the album too i guess and i know that i was saying like that it was a sloppy album, but I feel like they could have picked a better outro. In fact, if they just omitted this completely and just had what you're doing as an outro, that would be fine for me. I would like that better than this because this isn't even that great of a song. And as an outro, it feels even worse. But yeah, that's the track by track breakdown. Now let's get into my, my, my thoughts. <laughs> My thoughts are that it this is the most overhated album in the history of all of the albums. People hate this album so much because it's sloppy and because it's so messily put together and because it's like kind of gross sounding, but I think that that adds so much charm to it and it's part of why I like it because it's sort of like Jangle Pop is this like sloppy, messy sort of genre and like you can just make the excuse that this is just supposed to, that this is just early jangle pop and then it can make yourself feel better but yeah that's this album i'm gonna be trying to upload uh weekly again now because i haven't for the longest time so yeah i will see you guys next week then hopefully probably goodbye bozos